It's top of the hour. So let's go live on YouTube. And you're live, it says. All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. And uh, yes, to this first uh, gather, this first debate uh, in 2024. So we're going to break the ice this year um, with a discussion about concurrency in Java, how things evolved over the past, what, almost 30 years. Um, and I'm looking forward to hear your opinion in the chat in Zoom or in the chat in YouTube. Bit of introduction here. Um, my name is Victor Renta. I'm from Romania. I'm coding for almost 18 years. And for the last 10 years, I've been doing workshops and consultancy from various companies throughout Europe, mostly. My topics are usually these, clinical, unit testing, architecture, and microservices, frameworks, of course, and performance and secure coding. But I must confess, I'm super lucky to be talking with very bright developers, very extremely bright developers. So with the stuff that I learned myself from the groups that I, that I work with, I like to share back via such events like this for the community that we have around here, the European software crafters. This is all basically, all these efforts are to um, strive to become better developers, to um, keep on learning, to keep discovering stuff, to recover the joy in engineering and software. So I'm trying to do the, to, to organize these events with the community for the past several years. And we are more than 6,000 people. Let's put this on the screen. We have we are 6,000 people gathered here around uh, software crafting, basically uh, looking at how we can become better as the professionals. So join us if you didn't yet. And uh, may I see uh, 97 people in the Zoom and 50 more on YouTube. So keep on shooting the ideas. Hello, Simon. Good. So I have this uh, community, I help in this community, and I also have a YouTube channel in which you can find some of my past talks. Right. I have family, two, two kids, a cat, and a garden. And with that, let's jump in. So, <laughs> straight in. Let's see. Um, with concurrency. Why do, why do we want concurrency? Why do we want to run stuff in parallel? And I have in mind right now two use cases that I want to, uh, to have clear first. The first use case is called, um, it's called fork join. It's when you have some thread, some, some flow, some use case, run a request, and a message on a queue, and you want to suddenly break your execution into two in independent um, um, tasks that run in parallel, but after which you want them to join back so that you can get their results or their status. This is basically a fork join operation, right? So this is mostly used in the case you want to aggregate the results that you get from several APIs. You could run to one or five queries to different APIs, get the data back, put them back, put them together in one piece and send them out. Like if you want to, or if you create an aggregating back and forth front end, for example. You need to do that, fetching stuff from multiple APIs, multiple microservices, packaging them together and go, right? The other, the other kind of scenario that we're going to face is a fire and forget. In such a scenario, you're going to have a long flow that you want to leave behind running in the background. Now, some examples are good here, like sending emails, like processing some uploaded file or exporting some massive data. These are usually commands, changes to... Um, uh, tasks that change stuff, do side effects, right? Now, whenever you start such a task, the first question you have to ask yourself is, when did it finish? Did it finish or not? Is it still running? Is it hang? Where am I? Where is the task progressing? What percentage is done of the import? Also very important is how do I notice, how do I get notified of the success or failure? And how and where do I see the errors? Every time you leave behind yourself a task running in the background, you are, you are opening the door to like losing your errors or missing stuff or how do I see the status, right? In all sorts of Kung Fu, you can, you can go from as simple as pushing a WebSocket notification into a browser up to designing a full-fledged status page for the imports that the user has started or for the exports for the past month in your bank, uh, in your home banking application. So things can get from very simple to very complex over there. Now, my plan is to walk you through the evolution of the Java concurrency primitives and, and, and principles from the early days until today and tomorrow. So let's see, prehistoric. 
It was 1995, raining outside. And they were crossing, they were, they were making Java, right? Java was the first programming language in the world to have threads, to have direct abstractions over the platform, over the operating system threads. So back then, and there will be the commercial here, right? The commercial is, hey, come to Java, we have threads. So these threads, you can instantiate with new threads. In 1995, in 2000s, this was the trend, right? And, uh, but what, what are the problems with this? First of all, every, th every thread you allocate is going to map in Java, if you do that in Java, it's going to map to an operating system thread, which keeps as a stack, as, a, as an execution stack, keeps half a megabyte, maybe a full megabyte of RAM blocked for the execution stack of that thread. So, you know, you, when you call a new method, uh, a new a new stack frame is added on top of you and then on top of you to keep your uh, parameters and local variables. This is called the stack frame, the, the, the stack of the execution stack of the thread. And this is a stack frame of calling a method. And they get, they, they get stacked one, one on top of the other until you exit the method, in which case the, the, the stack goes, yeah, is basically unrolled. You know of the stack when you see a stack trace, basically, right? Or stack overflow. Right. Now, one problem is that the threads in Java map to the operating system thread. This is by design. And this means that whenever you do this, you allocate half a megabyte, maybe a full megabyte. And that's waste of memory many times. Then you run the risk if you do new thread to forget to close them. You might forget to close them or somehow hang them, which would eventually lead to out of memory or maybe even an operating system crash. Now, Mihai, things change in Java 21. You'll see. So out of, error, out, of error, out of memory error can occur if you allocate threads too much. So if you have like a, a spike of, of, of requests coming to, towards your system, you're going to see an insane amount of threads allocated, which can actually blow up your operating system underneath. In some cases, I did that twice in my workshops. <laughs> I blew up my machine. Another problem that uh, this approach forces you to, to, to embrace mutability of state in a concurrent flow which can lead to race bugs, synchronized issues, and deadlocks. So to avoid concurrent mutation of data from multiple threads, you're going to have to use some, some concurrency control primitives like synchronized or, I don't know, latch, um, cyclic barrier, and God knows what. And if you missynchronize those blocks, you can easily deadlock your app. Hanging threads, losing more memory, even more. Yes, virtual threads in Java 21, they're going, to, they're going to happen in front of you today. Now, let's see some code doing this, doing threads in the good old ancient prehistoric style. We are here fetching the preferences for, um, of the user, imagine. Super simplified code. Using the preferences, I'm fetching the beard according to the preferences of the user. And, the vodka, and then, after I get them back, after I get them back both, I construct here a, an object which I return as a result to my client. Okay. Now I have some unit tests that can, you can run in this Git to the, and, and they prove that this does the right thing. You notice here we are, I am instantiating a thread and starting it and later waiting for it to complete. However, if for some reason some of them hang, I might have threads left behind which accumulate there. Then next thing, what if for some, in some more advanced case, what if the two independent tasks that run here and there, what if they start stepping on each other's toes, changing the same state concurrently? Well, then you will have to turn to some synchronized, to some, to some re-entrant lock, to some kind of latch, stuff that, uh, that you, um, uh, that would make your flow thread safe, right? So this promotes mutability. Mutability and multithreading is a dark topic. But again, this is prehistory. I don't want to spend much time on that topic. So things have evolved very rapidly. And um, um, then came executors. The idea is that um, we want, they wanted to keep the number of threads you use under control. One. And secondly, reuse the same threads multiple times for, for, for short-lived tasks. I mean, allocating half a megabyte of thread and doing a, sh um, uh, a, a kernel move and then going back to user space just to solve a little task was, was, was too heavyweight. So they've added very, very, very rapidly the executors. 
Executor allows you to execute some arbitrary code here, but notice the void return. The, the commercial on that, on that moment was, was reuse, the, reuse the threads. Executor in this case are, is going to execute the tasks you are, you are giving it, it, you are giving it, and keeping the, 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 let's say, the excess tasks in a queue, in a queue, waiting to get, uh, I will show you the code, and the code will, 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 will tell the story. Look, the, the egg thread proof. Is this one? Yeah. Notice that I'm using over here an executor, which is instantiated somewhere else in another class, with to have exactly 200 threads. So there will be 200 threads waiting for work in that fixed thread pool. Now, whenever I say execute, this task over here, this runnable, is going to be sent to work on that executor. But if all the 200 threads are busy, my task is going to, is going to wait in a queue. It's going to be added to a queue waiting for the other workers to complete. When, the, when one of the workers is free, the first task in the queue is going to be put to work, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I'm recycling threads over here, right? And there will, there will be a queue in front of us. That's a semaphore. It's actually a bounded queue. I'm not sure about the internal details. It could be a semaphore somewhere in there. But the idea is that these tasks work on, uh, in parallel on, one, uh, on um, uh, one of those 200 threads. Now, notice that the execute that was uh, initially here uh, returns void. Since my execute returns me void, that means that the task that I'm passing it to it needs to change some state, needs to report some state by itself, needs to go and change state. And this is what it does. It sets the data. Also, notifying in a way, using a countdown latch, decreasing, basically when this turns to zero, the await that the main thread is blocked at there is unblocking the initial thread, which then can continue and return the JSON to the client. I would repeat that. The execution goes here on an HTTP thread. Here, execute, completes immediately, but this task over here is scheduled, is, actually, is moved to execute on one of these 200 workers if there is any available. If not, it's in the queue. The same happens here. So in zero milliseconds, you get to this point after you enter the method. Actually, not zero, because you have the fetch preferences for. So after you fetch the preferences, you, fort the, you, you, you request these two to happen in parallel. And then you wait. You wait for what? You wait for these guys to do countdown on the countdown ledge. You, you realize how easy it is for this to, to go wrong, isn't it? If this throws an exception of any, of any kind, you never count down. What happens? This thread over here is hang forever at the await. There are, there are, there are ideas. Let's put a timeout. But it's full of danger. All this is full of, of danger. It's very easy to get it wrong. Because it uses mutability, and you have to do manual thread synchronization somehow to let them know if they can continue. Right? Ugly. So it does reuse threads. But it still mutates state, which runs into the risk of introducing bugs, deadlocks, and uh, deadlocks while you try to protect the changes in the data. Really, 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 really dangerous. Right? So this is that stage in life. Right? Now, this thread pooling thingy introduced a new risk. Yay, one more risk. The risk is that you could starve the thread pool. Now, thread pool starvation means that one of the tasks you, that works on one of those workers is um, keeping the worker blocked for too long, it, uh, technically impeding others from running. So imagine one day someone evil goes here and then you know what I'm gonna just I'm just gonna sleep for one minute. Let's do that. If you sleep for a minute, that means that you basically blocked one of the two hundred threads in that executor for one full minute. If you get 200 uh, tasks like this on the, on, on the worker, on, on the thread pool, there is no worker left to serve for one minute. So your system is hang for one minute in that case. This is called thread pool starvation. This is what happens when you share stuff with others and they abuse what you shared with them, right? Some tasks might block the worker threads for too long and that's not fair. That, that hurts the fairness of the whole story. It's not fair for one task to keep a worker busy for one minute. How does the main thread retake control? The main thread is blocked. 
So basically, the, the HTTP thread is blocked here until um, a down countdown is called twice by the workers above. It's, it's blocked. Keeping half a megabyte in memory, blocked. What? Bad. Next stage. Next stage, Java, Java 5. The commercial was don't return data. I mean, no, return data, don't mutate it. Return, don't change. That's the commercial. All right? So the idea is that you can get the result of something that, sh that, that happened in the future using get and then blocking your thread until, until the, um, uh, the result is available. Right? Now, you can return a value instead of changing the data in a functional programming style. That reduces the risk and the need of doing mutation protection using synchronization primitives. You can just return stuff. Okay. So, but you still run the risk of starving the thread pool. Code. Features. This was the, 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 the age of futures. API fetch preferences, fair. And then with the preferences, fork. In what way? Executor. The same executor from above, from, from before, submit. But this time I don't do execute, I do submit, and which gives me back a future. This future over here allows my thread later to cleanly block for the result. So my HTTP thread is going to immediately get to this line because these are non-blocking operations. I'm just going to uh, ask for something to happen. And then when my uh, HTTP thread does beer feature dot get, in that moment, the thread hangs until the beer future returns the result or an exception. The same happens for, uh, for this. But if I'm lucky, then uh, basically the beer is, takes this time. The vodka takes this time, and perhaps, perhaps, while the while the beer is being completed, perhaps during that while, vodka is also done. So basically, I'm overlapping. If if time flows in, uh, down, I'm overlapping the the requests for beer and for vodka. They happen in parallel, right? But I don't need any more latch kung fu protection. No, I'm just doing get for the result. Very easy, and I'm sure you've seen that. Now, this. This is the time that we first met Future Void. It's a, it's a thing, right? If you have a function that returns you, uh, you would see Future of Void sometimes, which means that, that's, that, that that work didn't return you any data. It just gives you a signal when it completed or the error that happened if it happened. So this is uh, when, you, when you when you manipulate the future of a void, it means you are technically looking at the method not giving you anything, but that future allows you to wait for it to finish or to see errors. Okay, if you do get on that future, you're gonna see the errors. Fun. This model is a push pull model. On one side, the worker thread is gonna return the data, and then on the other side, the, uh, the thread which asked for the data to happen is going to block pulling the result back. OK, but I have to pull the result back. And this is a problem of this approach. It blocks threads. So right now, the HTTP thread over here that it enters, it block, it's blocked at the get method over here. Get is a blocking call, exactly. Get is blocking. And that's a problem in, in system ex, uh, exposed at, uh, at a high request rate under heavy load. Uh, blocking the HTTP thread can actually lead to extremely bad consequences. For example, if you if you block all the threads from your server, from your tongue, whatever you're using, then your server might not be able to take the next the next HTTP request coming in. And it could happen that this new HTTP request is extremely critical, like it's uh, the customer trying to place a bid or placing an order. You can't afford returning a 503 service unavailable if someone tries to give you money <laughs> to give you money like placing an order or a bid so you don't want to have your your your, your server threads blocked your http server threads blocked. you want them to be readily available to get new requests and respond them as fast as possible you don't want new requests to have to wait in a queue to get the threads to work no so that's the next stage the renaissance of the of the concurrency in Java um, talked about callbacks, and this was the age of uh, in which the commercial was don't block threads. 
Don't block threads because that might make you miss business cases, right? Yes, there would, there could be things where we're going to debate. Let's first round trip through this, and then we're going to come back to this. Now, completable future, then apply. Now, you might be familiar from other languages like JavaScript with the concept of a promise. Now, a promise is actually something that is going to give you some data in the future or an error. So, computable future are the Java version of a promise. I could say promise equal, 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 computable future. Equal, equal, three equals. Uh, so, uh, this is the Java name or, uh, for a promise. It's, it promotes a model in which the thing, the flow is callback based, technically, right? Attempting to block less threads by chaining together asynchronous steps. Let's see some code first. Computable future. Uh, that was the callback, basically. Now, uh, your head might start to hurt at this point. First thing that I do here, I ask the API uh, this is a, to, to fetch the preferences for the user. Notice that I'm passing the executor to tell my computable feature on what thread pool I want it to block. Quick parenthesis for the Spring friends in, in the room. Do not ever use executor service from GDK if you are in Spring. Use thread pool task executor which is uh, Spring thread pool, always, to, pro to propagate trace IDs, security context, stuff like that. But for demo purposes, I am, I am fetching the preferences on this thread pool with the same 200 threads. Fine. Right? Next, after this pref these preferences are, uh, are done, are, are retrieved, then apply fetch beer. Which means, technically, using that, those preferences you've, you've, uh, you've got above, call fetch beer on the same thread pool. Right. Now, this call, uh, basically, uh, this line and this line, all of these lines, they complete immediately. If my HTTP thread is going to exit my method in less than a millisecond, it's going to be out. Full non blocking. So, again, supply a sync. Hey, fetch the preferences. Then, given the preferences, and notice that I never put my hands on the preferences object. I can't do, I can't ever do this again here. I don't have the preferences. I have to manipulate them wrapped in this promise thingy, right? Now, the preferences, given the preferences, APIs fetch beer of the preferences. Then, at the same, uh, at the same moment, basically, the supply thing tells this code to start working. So let's draw all this. First, there is the, fe the, the fetch preference. Let's call it P. After P is done, fetch the beer. In parallel to all of this, vodka is being requested. So th and, and then and then and then comes the fun part. The fun part is here. When beer is done and vodka is done, then combine them together. That's called the join operator. How do we combine them? By putting them both together in a daily object, which then I return out to Spring as a computable future. All right? Maybe this may, would make more, it would be more fun for you guys if I say mono here. It's the same idea. It's the same, it's the same reactive paradigm, but with computable future since Java 8. Still a bit imperfect. Yes, Janek, you're right. There are some blocked threads. I'm going to go there in a second. But for now, just breathe this problem. There was an HTTP thread. Let's, uh, there was an HTTP thread that was, once upon a time, there was an HTTP thread that forked in two. Get the preferences, get the vodka. After the preferences, get the beer based on the preferences. And then when they have the beer and the vodka, join them together and produce a dilly. That you return out. It's a fork join operation. Extremely weird to read. And um, um, it's, it's hard to read, hard to maintain, hard to reason about. But like Janek pointed out in Zoom here, there are some threads blocked still. Because the fetch preferences, in the end, they do block. Because I am using the REST client, the new version of the, the not REST template, it's REST client. I'm using a blocking HTTP client. If I want to go full non-blocking, the only way I could, I could do that is using a web client. Web client, non-blocking HTTP, um, uh, uh, non-blocking that can do to future and produces and gives me back a computable future. Right. 
So I can do that, but that means I am going towards the reactive model. But the, the idea is here, also on the slide, that if you want to, to go full non-blocking, you would need to you would need to use some drivers which allow you to do calls over the network in a non-blocking style, like web client, like HTTP client in GDK, like uh, Quarkus REST client, uh, async HTTP client, maybe even reactive GDBC driver, reactive Redis driver drivers. Um, libraries that allow you to call over the network and then on a callback without blocking any thread give you, give you back the results so there are some threads blocked right now in my code but i could get rid of them if i use the necessary drivers right good so i am maximizing part of yeah what um um yeah you know the behavior of this code, I actually have a load test that I've run just before starting today. It's in the code here. You can run it yourself. And it's very, very, very enlightening if you if you run it yourself on your, on your machine. Load test with Gatelink, which tests all the cases that you've seen over here. And the results are here. And I've checked. And um, the callback-based strategy here has the exact same behavior as the others. There is one black sheep here, which I will explain a bit later. But the point is, they all behave the same in terms of time. Uh, um, uh, they paraly I've parallelized the flow just as before. So I am running still in parallel the fetch vodka in parallel with the um, beer and the, and the preferences. I'm actually a bit faster, honestly, because if, again, if preferences, let's draw time flows um, like this. Okay. Let's imagine that preferences takes this amount of time. This is the preferences. And then the beer takes this amount of time. Okay, beer. Now, in parallel with all this, Voska could take a lot of time, which in the first version, the code was, was looking like get the preferences, get the beer and the vodka. What I'm doing right now is get the beer and then the preferences in parallel with. I'm not sure if you get the point. But it's a bit more efficient because I'm chaining together the flows in the correct uh, way. To be honest, I could rewrite the first version to do the same if I'm honest. But anyway, good. So you supply a sync on that executor, the worker thread picks up your request, calls the network, and then when it, the result is back, it's going to call you, it's going to push you back some signal into the next chain, into the next operator. Running this, and after that is done, it's going to push into here, into, in, into here. On the other flow, Fetch Vodka is going to finish and it's going to push here. And when both are done, then they are going to be combined using in a, in a new object, right? So it's, um, um, it's, it's a paradigm shift, exactly, like you noticed. It's a paradigm shift. You, you can't just call, call a method and go away. You need to embrace compatible features, and what this is going to end up is in a chain of operators like this. It was Java 8 back then. In, that, in, that, in those days, reactive programming was rising, and I'm going to go there in the last section. For now, it's a paradigm shift. You will not see data alone anymore, but it will always be wrapped in a compatible future monad. And exactly, what the heck is a monad? Go in Google. Right? And um, yes, uh, 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 Valentin, if CPU has a single core, you can use still multi-threading because of time sharing. On a, single, on, on, on a single CPU, physical CPU, the OS is able to time slice multiple threads to execute one after the other. So no problem if you have a single physical CPU, definitely. And it's similar to React if you've realized the, 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 the resemblance. Error signals replace exceptions. This is shocking. People are going to go here, I'm going to go to some method fetch beer, and they're going to, they're going to throw an exception. Or maybe it's already thrown by this code. And then they're going to go back here in the, where I came from, and they're going to do something stupid. They're going to wrap this in a try catch. This will never run. This will never run because the exception that you are throwing from fetch beer will never reach this point. The exception, basically, basically, you can't catch exceptions occurring in asynchronous flows. The only thing you can, the, the closest match to that is to chain an operator that says exceptionally, hey, if I have an error, let me log it and then fall back to some beer with <laughs> no beer. <laughs> Thank you, AI. With a beer with no beer. Okay, default, right? 
That's the only closest match you have. So the idea here is that with compatible future and again with reactive correspondence, with the, with the reactive versions, with reactive frameworks, there are two channels in any asynchronous, in any promise, there are two channels. You have to feel that. One channel pushes you data, pushes you the element that you were waiting for. The other channel can push you an error. And a compatible feature can either be successful or fail. Now, in case one of the steps you execute on this chain, maybe this one, maybe, I don't know, this one, why would this fail? I don't know. In case any of these fail, then from your data uh, channel, you're going to fall to the error channel. You're going to propagate the error further unless you go with an, you come with an exceptionally and you provide some recovery mechanism, just like a catch, the, the equivalent of a catch in imperative programming. Right. Why uh, try to make your comments a bit shorter? If you want to debate with the others in the group, feel free to write poem points. But if you want me to read it, two sentences max, or come back with the idea after I finish presentation. Okay? Don't forget your idea. Note it down, and in the in the end, you're gonna debate it again. And there we are. Let's go in the modern age. Modern Age, introduced in September last year, Java 21. Modern, the commercial is blocking is free. Don't be afraid to block threats. That's the commercial. That's the ad. Now, I'm going to try to explain virtual threads with one horrible slide. Um, and uh, start debating stuff. Because this is new age stuff. This is cool stuff. This is trendy. This is still exploring. People are researching into this. Let's start small. Once upon a time, there were, uh, up until Java 21, every time you had a thread in Java, that thread in Java was mapped to a thread in the operating system, Linux, whatever you had behind you. Now, starting with Java 21, things changed. In what way? Now, the KUR threads, the operating system threads that uh, Linux gives you are still there, of course. But they are heavy, as we said, half a megabyte, maybe a megabyte of fixed stack. And you can't really allocate thousands of them. It's hard to see four, five thousand threads. It's not really. So, uh, and the operating system is able to time slice them. It's able to basically have uh, four such threads, for, for example, and then put them to run on the same CPU, physical CPU, one after the other. Can can do, let's say, preemptive scheduling is the official term. Can swap them in or out on the on the CPU whenever whenever the operating system wants to. This is. Like history. Now, what's new? Since Java 21, the GVM has virtual threads. These are small, small execution units. Manage, uh, they have a small stack, which is dynamic in the sense that you don't have to have a fixed stack of one megabyte. Um, when, you, when such a virtual thread is not running on a carrier thread, when it's parked, when it's blocked, the heap, the heap, the stack, the stack, the methods that it ran are stored on the heap, are parked in the Java heap. So these things over here, when not running, they live on the heap, occupying the least, I mean, the exact necessary amount of memory they need. Because their stack is kilobytes, you can have hundreds of thousands of them. Whereas before you can have 1,000 maybe, here there are guys on the internet um, showcasing examples with millions, one million of virtual threads. You can Google, there's a guy, hey, one million virtual threads. It's easy, actually, it is myself, but the idea is that GVM, GVM is scheduling these virtual threads. In what way? If a virtual thread um, blocks for any reason, maybe trying to write into a file, maybe are facing a re-entrant log, maybe trying to run a query in the database or, net, or a REST API network of any sort, you block your Java code, your Java thread, your Java code through GVM. So whenever you go to the GVM and, and, and you open a connection and wait for the result, GVM was rewritten to unmount your virtual thread from the carrier thread and let the and basically park the 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 virtual thread here and another virtual thread that was available to run run it on the on the carrier thread so you see um up until here all good up until here all good 
We have virtual thread that can execute on the CPU mounted on a carrier thread. And whenever they try to do in Java something that blocks the thread for any reason, GVM is gonna is gonna, is gonna kindly unmount the virtual thread from the operating system, the carrier thread, and use the carrier thread to do other virtual threads, to run other virtual threads. Up until here, all good news. Now, bad news. Uh, this virtual thread thingy is a Java only feature, meaning the GVM code, the Java code, was uh, was instrumented, was changed since March. They are working on that last year. It was changed to have to basically wrap all the places where you block your threads to do different things. With but there is a problem. If your thread blocks in native C++ code, that would make your GVM unable to unmount the virtual thread from the carrier thread. This is called thread pinning. It's, a, it's bad because that means that the green thread and the, and, the, and the carrier thread, they are stuck with each other. You can't reuse the, the red one because your blocking happens outside of your control in the GVM, deep inside. Okay? And that could happen in, with... And the, the practical examples are native methods, but more dramatically, synchronized keyword. If your Java code calls into a method, which in Java is using synchronized keyword, synchronized keyword is still implemented with C++ code. And your virtual thread is going to block there with the carrier thread underneath and die there. Okay? You are back at thread starvation. You are, you are burning carrier threads. And in times of trouble, the GVM might allocate more carrier threads, leading again to more waste of memory. Or, or that the lack of available carrier threads could starve some virtual threads which are eager to run but don't have how to run because all the red ones are blocked in synchronized uh, blocks. Right? So pinning is bad. Practical impact. Libraries that we still have in Java, in, in Java, a lot of them are using synchronized under the hood. If you jump on virtual threads hoping that uh, virtual threads are, are free to block, you're gonna you're gonna discover that some dark library that you're still using, maybe a version one year ago, still synchronized blocks your thread. Game over. Your virtual thread is stuck with op with carrier thread underneath. This is this problem. Second problem. CPU, so basically we can't use synchronized with virtual threads. No, the, the solution is to refactor, is to refactor your, your, your synchronized blocks to use re-entrant blocks. What the heck? Let me show you. Jackson. Jackson had an issue. Is this is here? No, not this one. Ah, it was another issue. Another issue that was happening in what library? The Postgres driver. Can I find that? Let's see. Um, how fast can I be? Let's see. Postgres GDBC driver. Let's see. Let's see. There. The Postgres GDBC driver version, I don't know what, 42.6, uh huh. Replace the usages of synchronized with reentrant lock. Boom. That's what your, your libraries should do to be thread, to be virtual thread friendly. Until they do that, they're going to pin your virtual thread and you're not going to be taking full advantage. Right? Interesting. Okay, cool. Now, the second problem, CPU monopolization. What, what does that mean? It means that, remember someone asked, hey, can I run multiple, uh, multiple threads even if I have a single physical core? Of course you can. Because the operating system has this scheduler inside, which can do preemptive task context switch. Can be basically take a thread out of the processor, pause it, and put another one to run on that single core, and so on. Java can't do this up now with virtual threads. So if a virtual thread never blocks, but keeps doing CPU work forever, forever, doing, I don't know, Fourier transformations for 30 seconds, that uh, GV and never touching network, never touching files, never touching reentrant logs or databases, nothing, then GVM can't interrupt it. What happens in that case? It's uh, unfair. It's unfair to have a virtual thread uh, stuck on a carrier thread for, for 30 seconds while others are waiting to get the chance. Fairness. Of course, all of these solutions could be, could be solved, all of these problems until now can be solved by allocating sufficient amount of carrier threads. 
but you want to keep them low, right? Two problems, pinning and CPU monopolization, depending on the kind of work. So if you are, if you're, if you're, if your use case is doing CPU bound work, if what keeps you from doing more is CPU, virtual threads are not going to help you much. Virtual threads are there to help you when your threads blocked doing network. Like most of our microservices and systems, distributed systems do now, right? But if you're doing CPU hardcore stuff, virtual threads, are, you're not going to see a big difference. Right? And there is another problem to, to today. You can't tell uh, GVM where to... Can you? I'm not sure if you can... If you, if you can but yeah, you can. There is, there is a way you can tell the GVM to, to, to uh, have a more carrier threads. Right? But I'm not sure if today you can, run, you can decide, if you can tell GVM to run a virtual thread on a specific carrier thread pool. After research, I don't know for sure. Now, next problem, the third and last problem here with virtual threads is that there are some libraries. Now, the thread pools were the default way to run, to execute parallel code with Java for, for, for 30 years. Libraries have adapted to that. Some libraries do the following trick, so, like Jackson, for example, up until a recent version, um, are storing in a thread local variable, in a thread local variable bound to that physical thread, they are storing some cached data, knowing that the same thread is going to be recycled and come, and, and, and come back to do other tasks later. So a library could store in a thread local some data for later use in another follow in another future request hoping they're gonna get to see the same data again guess what if virtual threads are so cheap that you don't need to thread pull them because they are so cheap it doesn't make any sense to recycle virtual threads you're going you're just gonna create new ones every time but if you create that's the general recommendation here do not reuse do not reuse do not pull virtual threads. just create a new one and if you do that the libraries that expect to see back the thread local data they've put previously, they're gonna, they're not gonna see the data there. So on one side, they are not gonna perform as well. On the other side, they, they will keep adding the heavy thread local data to the virtual thread, burdening the virtual thread. But, but how about the commercial? Blocking is free. You know, they're gonna hijack the goal. They are gonna burden the virtual thread. So libraries need to evolve to not use thread pools to store cache and heavy data. You can still use thread, uh, thread local data, although the recommendation is to move towards scoped variables, not yet ready in Java 21. We hope to be ready by, by 25 uh, long-term support. So yes, indeed, Harpal, you're right. Virtual thread should be used by IO bound operations. So object pooling, <laughs> libraries that are caching stuff on the thread hoping on the thread local hoping to see the same thread again they are gonna break the the dream okay right I, i'm sure the management between carrier thread and virtual thread they are going to improve it until one and a half year from now for sure and they are going to listen to what the community says and i'm sure we're going to see wonderful wonderful things like the ability to decide on how many and so on, on how many carrier threads, separate pools for this virtual threads and so on. Now, code. How do virtual threads look in code? And that's, that's the best part. API fetch preferences. Oh, you're blocking a thread for half a second. Who cares? API fetch beer. Oh, you're blocking a Oh, you should burn because this wastes memory. No, it doesn't. Memory efficient. API fetch vodka. Clear, straightforward code, no kung fu, no compatible reactive mono stuff. No. Just cool code. You might see a reason, you might expect to see some async wait over there, but that's another way to handle a concurrency that Java did not choose to use. Like Kotlin does it, C sharp does it, uh, Node uh, um, uh, async in JavaScript does it, but no. Java has another approach. It allows you to block, then freeze the thread underneath you so that you block in peace and harmony. Now, the, um, there are some downsides on this code. You can see that the, these two calls are no longer paralyzed. Okay? 
And the risks we've seen on the slide, threat pinning, monopolization, and uh, threat locals bound to these new virtual threats. And it's no better for CPU intensive. But this is not as, eff as efficient. This is exactly the virtual threads flow, which in my, in my uh, gate link shows that it is slower. Let's see if I can bring the Chrome to with the result on the screen. The, the virtual threads is slower there because I'm not paralyzing yet. Virtual threads, this. 1,500 something, right? However, here is the next version of the virtual thread uh, code. API fetch preferences, blocking code, no problem, no, no issues. I'm blocking a thread, who cares? But then, wait, what is this? Computable future, again? Can that happen? What, the, what, what happens? Please note the, the thread, the, the, the thread pool I'm using to run my future. I'm using a completable future to start an asynchronous task on a new virtual thread in parallel with the one fetching vodka. And in the end, I join them back. Done. Parallel work, parallel work with completable features on virtual threads. What? Interesting. Okay. And you still do like get or join. Oh, you're blocking thread here. Who cares? HTTP thread is a virtual thread. I have millions, hundreds of thousands. So parallel call are now wrapped. This is virtual callbacks. And in the in the in the in the report, you can see it's the same performance as the others. But it's again hard to read. It's hard to read, and there are some more disadvantages to this. Right? No, it's not worse. It's the same as the previous with completable futures, with the trick that I'm not blocking threads along the way, and I, I'm not doing then combine with. If you compare this with the callbacks, which was continuing to do supply a thing, then apply a thing, then combine, you don't see any of this, you do join. It's roughly like a futures plus virtual threads equal this. Run, get. Run, get. Although it's called join, not get. Right? All right. So, yeah, it's not very readable. You're right. It's not very readable. It's, it's, mm, mm, we can do better. I'm sure we can do better. And we can. You'll see in a second. So, Virtual thread, this is the summary of what we've discussed on the, on the slide. Let's see if, if there's anything new. Cheap to block, small stacks, kilobytes, fast to create and context switch. Do not pull them, create a new one, a new virtual thread whenever you need one. Simple code, because you just call the, 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 the API, you don't worry if you block threads. With the three risks we've discussed, monopolization by CPU bound tasks, thread pinning by in libraries, the code that you're using synchronized, or native methods and expensive thread locals that can hijack the model and burden the virtual thread. Good, but we can do better. This is not yet readable enough. And there is one more dark, dark problem there. Whenever you play, you, you play, um, whenever you fork, let's try to do this, it's pretty tricky. Whenever you have a task a thread forked into and then joined back and returned, there are two issues you need to understand. What if one of the tasks that you've started blows up? That was an error. Technically not here. Let's redraw this for a second. Let's make them like this. Uh -huh. And then here, uh, and you can see I love to draw on the screen. Perfect. Now, what if there is an error boom there? That error is gonna bubble up here and render the error. But the question is, would this still work? Is, should this still be allowed to continue working? If I know that the other branch of my fork blew up. Well, reactive programming calls this constellation. It's a blue arrow on the marble diagrams. But completable, and completable future and, and visual threads don't yet support that. If, if this blows up, the other one will still be working. You can't, it's one problem. And the second problem is when the client from over here Closes the TCP IP connection. Says, so, you know what? Uh, I, don't, I don't want the result anymore. Cancel. Close. Abort. What happens with this abort? Would this bubble up and cancel the two running flows? Well, now in this last code snippet, no. If the connection is closed, pff, so be it. I'm just going to uh, kill this thread over here, leaving the ones we've started there and there to work. They were just going to continue working. All right? 
So to benefit of virtual thread, even though the virtual thread is blocked, creating another request. Yeah. Now, back here. What's the next state? Where is Java going? What the, what's the trend in Java? Can we fix these problems? Yes, we can. It's called structured concurrency. We, they. Structured concurrency. And the commercial for this in Java 25, this is Java 25. Not yet. It's not ready in 21 yet. The commercial is that the virtual machine can now see the way you fork and join your tasks. Allowing you to do cancellation propagation from the client up to the two tasks it's the, uh, the, uh, uh, that were, were started, or from one failed task into the other that is still running in the diagram we've just drew. Okay, both cases I've, I've discussed before. They will be supported by this structured concurrency, and because virtual machine, let me show you the code first. There. We start with the tribute resources, and within the tribute resources, we say this is a shout down on failure, which means if any of these fails, cancel the other also. That's what this says here. Now, so I need both basically. It's a declaration that I would need both results from both parties, from both from both forks. When I do fork, I'm gonna spawn a new virtual thread here, here and here. Two new. Fun. But then when I do join, I'm going to wait for them to complete, to, to, to finish. So if you do the diagram in the same style, fork, fork, and then this baby over here, it's a join. Right. I get the values. Actually, I can do better here. It's join. Oh, no, get it. I get the value. Notice the new type in Java, subtask. I get the value, just like a future.get, knowing they've completed because I've joined them, and then I return. What's the cool part here? Since Java is aware in the in the code base, in the in the source code of how your threads are forking and joining, then you get support from the virtual machine instrumentation and profiler. What does that mean? But now we are a bit daydreaming. But GFR profiler, the profiler inside the VM, can actually link child threads with parent threads in structured concurrency. Here is a little sample of that. You see this? Uh, where, is, where is it? Where is it? Owner. Let's see, owner, there. The owner of this is thread number 83. It's, a, it's able to, this is a thread dump, what you're looking at here. Uh, basically, already, uh, Java can, with um, this structure concurrency, can dump in the thread dump the, uh, to, who, to what parent virtual thread do, do these two belong. They will be somehow linked to the thread that enters this method. Okay, so what do I gain with that? I can I can see it I can see in the profiler that I am waiting here for these two tasks. I could see in the flame graph that they are still doing that and that. I can do a hierarchical task analysis. One and second, I can break point there, and I hope at some point you're gonna be able to see the stuff you were doing in there plus the stuff that you did to reach this point. So you're gonna see the stack in the parent thread below you. Say, I got here because my parent, something that was impossible, it is impossible in any other, in any other asynchronous and concurrent pra pra paradigm. Webflux can't do this. No, no one else can do that. Um, uh, Kotlin can't do this. How can you link you know, with breakpoint and time share and, and time slide? So the idea is that the GVM it's going to be aware of how you fork and join. It's going to support you with breakpoints and flame, and flame graph and, and profiling report. Okay. Okay. So here is the explanation with more details. What I've said: fork, fork, join until it failed. With deadlines and stuff you can read afterwards. Look, this is the long story. You can pause the video and read. And this is reactive programming, extraterrestrial. What's this? They were always, they were also there somewhere along the way. Maybe after completed the future and before virtual threads, they came in. They. <laughs> they came in with their project reactor, Edix, Java, Mutinity, and Aka actors. They came in and they stole the best of us. <laughs> They've abducted the best of us. Now, um, oh, this is wrong. This is not how reactive programming looks. Reacting programming looks like this. 
API A, flat map A, API B1, flat map B, API C2, map. Folks, reactive programming code is atrociously hard to understand. I also teach reactive programming, so I have in my in, 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 in two times in my workshops, I had people with five, seven, eight years of experience with reactive programming, and during my workshops, I found bugs in their production code bases. I was enumerating the common pitfalls with reactive programming, and at some point, one of them was like, <laughs> and they realized during the workshop that they were repeating a network call in production. People with seven, eight years of experience with active coding. It is extremely hard to learn. Please, if you take something away from this, do not go reactive unless you really must. So do we still need reactive programming? We do, but for what use cases? To orchestrate stream of asynchronous signals of or events. Imagine Kafka events coming on a stream, on, 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 on a topic. Messages from Rabbit. Uh, readings from sensors, right? fluxes of data and streams of, of elements coming in at different time, like stock quotations, um, crypto trading, kung fu, stuff that comes in uh, real time and you want to orchestrate that. Yeah, I love reactor. Yeah, it's, it's mind bending. I mean, like I can do reactor. What can you do? What can you do? So indeed, uh, my head hurts in, in new ways, in, in, in a specific way after a workshop training of three days. In, it's, a, it's a specific part of my, of, my, of my skull that only hurts when we talk about reactive programming and we look at code like this. Message stream, there are messages coming in. First, group your messages by their type. So if there are red, red messages coming in, mixed with green messages coming in, and perhaps some blue messages coming in on a Kafka topic, for example, please sort them. The blue go here, the red go here, and the, the green go there. After you've sorted nicely the, the topic, this is what this, uh, this uh, uh, first line does. Then, please, for the blue one, ignore them. For the red one, Please group them. Uh, no, please. What? Group flux zip. Please call for each of these uh, these elements. Call two APIs, uh, A and B, A and B, A and B in parallel. But for type three, I want you to wait for enough. Wait for one hundred elements of type three, or maximum five hundred milliseconds. And when you get a full page, or five hundred millis are done send this page to that API to bulk import the green ones into the, that system. And if it fails, please retry it three times with a back of exponential of half a dozen seconds. How on earth would you do that without reactive? It's try three times more code if you do that without reactive. So there are some, 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 some cases here in which reactive programming is still king. Right? Yeah, indeed. And you learn it, you struggle. It passes five, uh, six months without contact. You come back, it's like, like where am I? <coughs> Flat <coughs> What's that? <coughs> right? So, um, yeah, you know, at the same performance, reactive consumes less resources than blocking. Why? Because we were, we used to block threads, remember? So, virtual threads versus reactive. Using reactive programming just to avoid blocking threads, to take more load for flows which are limited by networking and API calls, can be an expensive mistake. You don't need virtual, if you, if you don't need reactive Kung Fu, if you only manipulate in your APIs separate signals, request by request, um, um, the search results as a whole. If you don't take advantage of streaming data in and out, if you are just passing mono in and out, then you did it wrong. You need to refactor back to virtual threads. I have two clients which are considering, still waiting, of course, because it's still new, considering giving up on reactive on some of, on, on some of, them, on some of their microservices. They took this, this approach. We all do reactive. And they've put, they've made client jars with reactive Kung Fu inside, with reactive uh, clients inside, 
And now they are looking at, do we really need that kind of? Yeah. Is there any way to avoid using flux and use VT? Yeah. If you are manipulating streams of signals, flux, that is. And if you want to do like time bound buffering, retries, and cancellation thing, Kung Fu, uh, reactive programming is still the way. So it's like anything else. The trick is to use the best way to code for you. Exactly. And here is the reason for the table. There. Ta -da! Conclusion. If you want to do, so, there are basically three. This table is shamelessly copied and adjusted from Quarkus. <laughs> there are three ways to do uh, to implement an endpoint. Fully synchronous code on uh, carrier thread, operating system threads, no virtual threads. Right? This is good for CPU bound. In case you are, you are limited by CPU, you don't really need virtual threads. You're just going to be hoping to see a benefit where you want. So you won't get any benefits, so why risk, right? Good. Now, if your flow is using, is, is, uh, is manipulating data streams, then reactive code with, with mono in, in, in Spring, uni in Quarkus, single in Android, this is going to give you the best feeling. And I, by the way, Android is going to take advantage still a lot from reactive because they are manipulating signals, changes of GPS, tracks of fingers on the screen. That's perfect for reactive, okay? But if you just have some IO bound flow limited by networking that you want to keep simple implementation, then you can go synchronous code on virtual threads. Perhaps for now, using completable future to fork and join and waiting for structured concurrency to help you with that a bit later. Right? With the risks that we've mentioned. Quarkus actually has an annotation you can put on your endpoint that tells if you want to run on a virtual thread or on a carrier thread. I did not see that in Spring yet, but since they are, they are probably going to add something. Right now, it's, a, it's a all or nothing in Spring. If you make your application, if you declare that my application shall use a virtual thread enabled, then everything is virtual thread. Which is not really bad. So we all still need to benchmark to experiment and you can take this git. Um, if you can take this git and, um, and um, clone it, play with it, change the, the, the load tests, put some tricks there and there and there. It's very simple code just to be able to quickly bootstrap it. So, um, that was what I was want that, that what I wanted to share with you guys. Maybe with also the uh, the slides with further reading. This one is very good. The the, the decision uh, that the Java uh, language team took, uh, the the options they had, and why they implemented virtual threads like this, with along with the limitations from the lead of the project loom of basically the guy that led the development of the virtual thread. Very good talk over there. Some articles that you can one you might want to read. Spring's opinion, Quarkus opinion. And I will wait for your opinion. So, folks, as far as I am concerned, my let's say my sharing towards you finished here. So if you're watching the recording from now on, I'm gonna look at the questions that come in either on the YouTube. So please be so kind because it was pretty intense presentation. This one. Be so kind and repaste your question. Uh, as it is raw, and I will read it again out loud, or compile it, uh, um, compress it a bit, and paste it after the, the line. If you want to have any debate on this, uh, I will be super um, uh, interested to learn to see what, how you think. I've seen many good ideas, so please be so kind. Repaste your question if it was unanswered, or if you want to hear my opinion, or if you want to debate, if you want to share your own ideas. Right, if you have to run, thank you all for attending. This will remain recorded, but I'm looking for your thoughts, your questions, your ideas. For example, one, one concern, something bugs me. How will reactive schedulers jump on virtual threads? Will they? Can reactive paradigm be mounted on virtual threads or not? Maybe I'm going too far with this, but what questions bug you? The question that I had that I had was related to testing. Awaitability. Await 
feel it, I think you mean. Is there anything can be used for our weight? Um, I'm messed up it, of course, but our utility. Um, well, our utility is a tool that you use to, to keep polling for some result. So, pay attention. Look, I'm gonna, because why not? I'm allowed to do that. You need to. So, awaitility. Let's see. Here, I'm using a utility to uh, continuously pull for max one second every 10 minutes, look for, uh, and look for something to appear in the database. Hey, is there anything in the, in the supplier the table called supplier? I'm waiting for some Kafka listener to process my message and insert the data into the table. Okay? In case uh, you need to ask and read the data from there every time, there is no other way than polling. But some key, in some situations you could, for example, I want to just show you this because I was very glad to find it. This verify is from Mokito. And if you are doing uh, like let's say gray box testing, if you if you can mock some of the of the classes in your in your in your in your, in your application, you can tell Mokito to wait for this method to be invoked max maximum within one second. So hey Mokito, is this method called in a second? Right? You can also so I am taking advantage of a, of a of a library that can signal me back and unblock my unit test tree, my unit test thread. It's preferable to do that. Perhaps you can you can listen to some reply message on a queue. Perhaps you can do a blocking receive. Do that if you can. All right. So no. Besides that, nothing else. Let's see where are you. What else we have questions here in Java twenty one. I'm not sure if I answer. I'm going to rush through this and wait for you to come back on this if it's not clear. In twenty one, can it be some sort of SQL hint to use specified number of threads. Okay, second time I, see, I also had the same question. Hey, how can I tell Java twenty one what number of carrier threads uh, I want to use? So, uh, to to use to run my oh my god virtual like I'm prompting the AI over here. Uh, what created no? Uh, how many platform threads are used to schedule virtual threads? Uh, and ta -da, this. I need to read it in more peace afterwards. But yeah, but not SQL hints. Yeah. Ah, you are dreaming of something like, you know what, this task I want to run on virtual threads on a carrier thread pool of max 5. Annotation on a method. Perhaps they could do it, it's not that difficult really. It's just a matter of what do we really need? Do we need that? Perhaps perhaps this is what you, you mentioned, you, you, you were looking for. Hey, this, um, I don't know, virtual threads. This, run on virtual with... Uh, with platform uh, threads equals 50 or, or, or 10. No? I don't know. Let's see what, what, what awaits. I don't know. Where can I find the recorded? Can you paste the link, please? YouTube. Yes, please the link to the guy. Code, code link coroutines. Haha. <laughs> Still look simpler until you debug them. If you debug a coroutine, if you breakpoint a coroutine, <laughs> God help us all. If you want to profile the execution, if you want to move data, metadata along, you need to use some scope, if I remember correctly. I think, I think that it's called scoped in, uh, in, in Kotlin to move metadata like the current logged in user. In Java, with virtual threads, you can just use thread locals or scoped variables, and they will propagate magically to all the child threads automatically. So they still look <laughs> not sure. Kotlin mm. looks simpler. I mean, welcome, Kotlin. Okay, and that being said, let's move to the next one. Because it's Java, exactly. <laughs> Lacho, how are you? So, uh, wait, wait, yes, good. Which is the best implementation for async callbacks that have to return a result to client? Well, what's wrong with computable feature? Uh, I think this one. Uh, I would this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Correct, Gulam. I agree with you. Reply relying on time. 
Ooh, you need testing. He's not a very good idea. Ah, you are looking at my oh utility and wondering. Hey, max blocking time one second. Ew, that is gonna delay my pipeline. Agree. That's why if I if I jump on that topic, that's why I generally prefer to um, uh, to keep tests like this to a minimum. Because first of all, uh, not, not only the fact that I'm in worst case, I have to wait a second to see a failure, not that. What I'm annoyed most of this is that if I have an exception in the, in the, in the listener code that I'm testing, that exception, I'm not gonna see coming up back here in my unit test thread. I'm gonna have to scan the logs of the application to see the exception. I'm not gonna see the exception cleanly coming towards me because I am pulling from a thread for effects persisted from another thread, the message listener thread. That's what I hate most. I can't, I can't see the actual exception coming towards me because I am testing from a different thread than the one that, I, that executes the stuff I want. If you ask me, this is what I like, what, what I hate most. But yeah, you could say this is an integration test. If I say that, maybe you're happy. You, 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 and you tag them with slow. There you go. And you run them once every hour, not every commit. There you go. If you have a system with lots of I.O., if you need high throughput, isn't Reactor a better approach than the what's standard? Uh, standard. I showed you a lot of options today. So lots of I.O., if it's a lots of I.O., uh, then I would consider virtual threads if I never, let's say, orchestrate, meaning receive, um, I don't know, weave together, uh, return, uh, streams of data like flux if i never do that virtual threads is better if i start combining elements buffering them sending them cold then react probably is a smarter choice so you will follow the same approach we are mocking all the yes exactly so try to keep i mean i want to see one execution of the concurrent flow with all the thread kung fu one but anything that is more complicated, any logic, and if I don't want to test that with our utility to have. No, I want cool, clean method calls into the logic to, to tell me what's wrong or not. Okay. Now, reactive event loop, or how? How a reactive event loop is better than just having a thread pull at the end? It will also create some threads to deal with IO. Tough one. And Guillermo already answers this one. Let's see what Guillermo said. Consumerless memory. Let's see. Reactive event loop. So yes, in reactive programming, you have, let's say, signals, and there is a bulk, there is a set of threads in, a, in some schedulers, which look for stuff to do. So how is reactive event loop better than just having a thread pool? Because at the end, it will also create some threads. Yes, but you see, um, if you block for IO some thread, from a thread pool, then you have two options. A, you will have a thread pool starvation. Other tasks trying to execute will not see any available thread in that, any available worker thread in the pool. Or B, you can scale up uh, and increase, uh, increase the number of threads, increase, allocate more threads. But that comes with a, with a penalty. If you are talking about pri prior to Java 21, that means plus one megabyte per thread. So reactive programming compared to Java 17, for example, rocks if you want to handle a lot of load because you can orchestrate all that load without many threads. You can have actually two or three or four threads, one per CPU, one per core, serving 10,000 concurrent requests. You can't do this. You never block the loop thread, exactly. You should never block into a reactive, uh, into a reactive scheduler unless it is a bounded elastic blah blah. With virtual threads, can regular threads be starved? With virtual threads, can regular threads be starved as well by CPU bound threads that are running? Ah, you mean like some other process or some other tasks in my GVM or on my physical machine? which compete with my, of course, if there is some, 
I'm not sure if you're if you're looking if you're telling me about a separate process or, or separate thread in the same GVM, but both are true. In the end, the the, the physical CPU, the physical core, is going to be shared with others competing for CPU, of course. An example here that comes to my mind is it comes from is a garbage collector thread, right? Competing with your with your with your application threads, trying to free up the insane amount of memory that you are now manipulating. Next thing you're gonna try, you're gonna try to handle ten thousand concurrent requests at once. But ten thousand concurrent requests at once is gonna is gonna blow the memory is gonna blow up. Right? SQL found it useful. Ah, there, is, there are hints to tell. I remember there are hints to tell the the execution planner. Um, how many threads you want to run for the query? Oh my god, dark memories. What is this? Huh? Ah, the YouTube link. Thank you. Good. Regarding the completable future framework, basically, language feature. Uh, if we use blocking code, is that a framework in just a language? If you, we use uh, blocking code, such as REST template, isn't this framework designed in such a way that the initiated threads of the async operations? Wait, 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 wait. REST template is a blocking. The good old REST template is blocking. No, no, no. If if you do REST template, get for I have the code. What the heck? If you do in my code here in the APIs, if you do this or the the new age uh, uh, REST client, both, both, both of them block the threads that the thread that called retrieve. No, it blocks. Even if these operations are long and blocking, like REST template and DB calls, no, it will block the thread there. So the thread which enters this method over here, thank you for question, thank you for, for, for asking. If you enter the, if your thread enters this method, whether it's, I will draw it in green, uh, uh, virtual thread, or in red, carrier thread, any kind of, any thread enters this method, when hitting the retrieve, that moment is going to block. If it's a virtual thread, then the retrieve down in its core is going to use some GVM primitive, which is going to, which was already changed in Java 21 to unmount the green thread, let the green thread hang there and release the underlying carrier thread to do other things. But if it were a in Java 17 or 11 or 8, if it's a carrier thread stuck in this retrieve, that we're going to die there for half a second for however it takes to get the result back, keeping half a megabyte of stack blocked for, the, for that duration. And you can have, I don't know, you could wait seconds for the response. And that's dramatic. It actually can cut down costs. React, that's what drew many to choose reactive programming. Hey, reactive programming can cut down costs. You can handle twice, 10 times more load with with the same machine. You don't need to scale up your cloud, la 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 la. And it's true. You save memory. But now virtual threads do it for free without all the complexity of the reactive paparado. Yeah. So uh, it's the thread initiating the blocking operation dies there. Yeah. Oh, you, you got an example. Sorry. For example, thank you. In this code, completable future supply sync fetch that asynchronously. Let's see. Completable future dot supply sync this. Oh, 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 good one. Pay attention, folks. Supply a thing and there is nothing after the comma. Let's copy this. Actually, I can adjust my code to fit your, your, your flow in the future, in the callbacks. If your, pay attention, this is going to be, this is going to be big. If supply a thing is not given this argument, I always, my, I always was careful to give it. If it's not given, something dramatic is going to happen. It runs on a fork join pool common pool. It's a shared thread pool with exactly n minus one. If I have ten CPUs myself, then that is gonna have um, is gonna have nine threads. So I am compete right now. This blocks one of the nine threads which are by default available in this common pool global per GVM. Any other doing the same thing, maybe here. It's going to take the second one. So now there are two men down. If I cut this, I just three out of nine. 30% of my GVM capacity is now dead. That's why I took careful, I, I took careful action to create an executor big enough to support all this load I was loaded. 
So completable future is, I hope that answers it. Next to me, hi, is it completable future blocking? Well, only, can I be short here? Only if you do completable future again, that yes, blocks your, or join. But if you do as you should, uh, stuff like uh, competitive future dot then apply or uh, then compose or uh, then combine or uh, these are non-blocking hmm? well, so you shouldn't be doing join and get on competitive futures you shouldn't be doing it. however you say but you did that yourself in the last example one of the last examples here you did join and get what is this this is bad, right? Yes, it's bad, but notice that I'm on virtual thread here. So what? I broke my HTTP thread, so what? I have 100,000, whatever, go. Okay. Exactly, use it, exactly, sorry, very good answer, I know, I see. Integration test makes more sense. In Reactor, we don't use list or stream, we all are flux, yes, but really, do you take advantage of that? Is that, a, I know that the good practice, fancy, la, 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 but does that really matter? Oh, um, um, here, Gulam. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But that's just pretending. That's my uh, opinion of seeing production systems. The general rule in reactive programming is that you should only take and return flux, not mono of a list. I know, I'm teaching stuff like that. But really, does that matter? Does it really matter if you send? the 200 results, the 20 search results in the screen to clients, one by one, would I see any, would I see any, let's say, significant difference, the tricky one, if, if I switch back to list, to mono of list, I, my lucky guess is that normally you won't care, Match, uh, if I switch back to um, uh, computer to, to sorry to mono of list. My what I've seen in, in systems in the wild is that they don't really stream out of an infinite flux of things coming from Kafka that lasts forever. No, it's just gonna go to Mongo, fetch three lines, time five fifteen lines, get them, send them, game over. If you keep the stream open and data keeps flowing in and you spit it out on the other end, then that's the use case to, to stick with, with reactive programming, of course. Not sure if, if that makes much sense at this time of the day. So if you take advantage of basically infinite streams, I could say that if you have at least one infinite stream, or if you use sinks or stuff like that, then reactive program. If you don't have infinite streams or if you don't have like long running streams, Think, think, think hard. When we have chain of micro, I, I, I'm shooting very fast here and I'm sorry, I may, I may be rushing over some very important details. Come back with more details if you want or reach me out on email, hey, about that. <laughs> Many people did that, so do it. When we have chain of microservices, what is the best co concurrency approach to use for communication between them? Well, if you go HTTP, I guess you are saying here HTTP probably, then virtual thread rock. Rock. Rock, rock, rock. Because calling another API is not gonna... <laughs> but, okay, you are saving one megabyte of RAM. But, you are still fragile not resilient, a failure in a long chain of rest calls, they're going to blow you up. But, retry. But, timeout. But, circuit breaker. So, why not <laughs> queues? Why not events? Blah, blah. Queues are more resilient. But if you don't care about resilience, if you're just reading data every time, maybe HTTP is good, but please don't chain five systems calling each other with HTTP call. This is just too 
wasteful. You are wasting uh, network latency, basically, between these systems. Why? Are you sure you want to do that? But in terms of resources, with virtual threads, you are not going to lose much if you call someone and wait. But your client over here is going to see a long response time. You waiting for all these fellows to complete. Plus, any error anywhere is going to kill the whole flow. So the, the war is not over. But if you have to choose between, if you are stuck with HTTP and you decide this is the best approach, then between reactive and virtual threads, virtual threads. Maybe again, I'm rushing to this. Sorry, but that's the first thing. First answer. That's fair. I wanted to hear you basically, but we are 90 people still here. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to rush to get it interesting for everyone. Oh my God, and more questions in the, in the YouTube. Sorry, I'm taking the Zoom ones first. Join the community, join the Zoom. In case of continuation, when HTTP is non-blocking, it creates an unknown. No, 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 no. Okay. Basically, you're asking how does a non-blocking HTTP um, client work? That's what, that's what you're asking, really. The, are, there, are there any threads inside it which are blocked or hang for any reason? Uh, no. Why? What happens underneath? Underneath that client, the, um, uh, let's say, the um, network adapter is registered uh, a callback. And when that callback strikes, then there is a signal, a signal, which is picked up by a, um, by a uh, event loop and that event loop is gonna if that is gonna eventually get a thread from a scheduler if you are on uh, if you are in reactor reactor terms scheduler and call back into the app but there is no thread waiting for the result there is a polling mechanism inside somewhere in there very very dark technical next thing i'm going to tell you is about interrupt requests but not, let's not go there in case of simple services, so there is no thread blocked while uh, you are waiting for an HTTP response if you are using a reactive client, reactive network client, like web client, like those on the slides. In case of a simple service with no fork joins needs, just simple calls, would virtual thread still be useful? Well, yes, um, because uh, you will uh, would be able to serve. I'm not, I'm not, you don't care about fork joins. Uh, what matters is load, is the load you have. If you have serious load on you, virtual threads have the ability to work fast, I mean, faster, to uh, spend less resources, so you will be able to take more load and reduce the number of loads that, of instances that you need to handle the same load. You could have two instances handling 10,000 10, requests at the same time. The load matter, not fork joining. Now, honestly, services taking 10,000 requests per second, what the heck is the system is this? I mean, if you have that, virtual threads are definitely going to help. No? So it's not something you need to embrace. It's something that if you, is, do you have enough load? Are you calling systems that keep you waiting for long enough? Then virtual threads are going to make a difference. If you're IO bound, right? And most of our microservices are IO bound. But if you have a, a small, low heat on you, few requests on you, it won't matter much. In some cases, a good alternative is to address those problems by having asynchronous architecture and using fully, asynch fully synchronous code. Uh -huh. By asynchronous architecture, you mean message queues, I think. Let's see. It's efficient to parallelize treatment that way. Uh -huh. Pierre, interesting, very, very good one. Of course, if you do the wrong show, you can bring a in your design. Mm -hmm. So basically, if I understand correctly, and I hope I do, um, if you put cues carefully, events carefully, then all your code could remain synchronous. And asynchronicity could be pushed into the message infrastructure. That's a good one. I like it. Do you advise in moving right away? No. <clears throat> Would I ever advise to move right away? No. Patience. <laughs> Let another, another version pass by. Maybe starting March 
what I've heard from clients. March, April, May, they are going to try to put some low risk, prof low profile risk system into pro in production, maybe in June, when it's summer, low pressure. Uh, not the critical ones, no, not yet. It's too, it's too young. But the libraries, the libraries that we are working with are still full of synchronized, of, of non native code blocking stuff, of keeping thread locals. Let the libraries evolve and meet the mindset of where Java is going, right? No. And if you move, for example, a service that runs on Java 11 to Spring with Spring 5, will it mean we'll have to update our. Yes, because, uh, wait, Spring 5? Aren't you a Spring Boot 3? I mean, breaking news Spring Boot 2 died. Uh, how to put it? End of life. End of life. The king is dead. This is Spring, Spring Boot. Uh, you need to migrate to Spring Boot 3, which is Spring 6, if I'm not mistaken. Let me... Anyway, so uh, yes, the libraries will be the problem. Mono of least, oh my god, yes, they're gonna burn in hell. Does it make a difference to go flux? Is Java 21 virtual threads the end of computable future? Virtual threads plus structured concurrency. Yes. For now, you see me using that. For... Oh, 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 a debate. We get on. We need to wait. Such a... Exactly. Thank you. The problem with computer future is the deal with happy path and unhappy path. Mm -hmm. The code would be difficult to read if you start exceptionally. Yes. The real code looks a lot with exceptionally and, and the way that it is designed, the computable future is very unreadable. Reactive code is uh, API are much more carefully thought of than the computable future exceptionally API. It's mindset. We have three methods we need to deal with. Yes, exceptionally handle it. And when complete, provide solutions for your business. It's verbose, it's Java. <laughs> it's Java. Thank you, Gil. It's functional program. The functional programming needs to be practiced needs to be practiced. We describe a pipeline of actions. Yes, we need to embrace first functional programming because if reactive programming is actually um, functional reactive programming, we first have to go functional then reactive. For simplify the error of pipeline, uh, Vavr. I don't like Vavr. I don't like Vavr, but that's a debate. Java developers, true Java developers don't use Vavr. <laughs> We virtual threads affect how we trace up the Vavr has a very high learning curve, very steep learning curve. Um, next thing you do, you give up on exceptions. Oof. Come on. After all, Java is imperative in nature, right? And the evolution of Java goes in back in that direction. Let's go imperative and let's unblock stuff underneath. Will virtual threads affect how we trace applications with Dana trees? Yes, of course, because the things that virtual that structured concurrency will will. Uh, we'll improve it. We'll improve it. We'll improve because you will have to. You will be able to link parent with child, but otherwise it will not degrade. Because in from what Java is concerned, virtual threads are just threads. They have thread stacks and everything that you can actually. I've recently had a Java flight recorder profiler on a virtual thread. You see the same thing. So you don't lose anything. They were very careful with that, but it will improve the structure. If you have a problem with non-blocking callbacks, reactive even loop and uh, the JavaScript, JavaScript. Yes, and there are some architectures that prefer to put a Node.js gateway in front because that's non-blocking in nature. I, I, was, I, was, I was like, what? Yes, why not? So. Yeah, but then you know what happens? Node.js is full of async hell. All the methods in your code is gonna is gonna are gonna be marked with async. Will HTTP? Sorry, YouTube fellows, Gallup fellows. I'm looking still in Zoom. Your questions keep rolling. Will HTTP servers like Tomcat switch to use only one? Yes, you can, and yes, they did. If you put this through Tomcat with Spring Boot three and all the kung fu in this git. Tomcat starts using virtual threads. I am using virtual threads over here. Uh, pff, I can prove that. Start on. Let's see. Uh, pff, 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 pff. Maybe I'm not. Uh, I have many exceptions here. Why? Uh, let me just virtual callbacks. 
Go back here. Good enough. Let's see. Localhost. Um, localhost slash virtual callbacks. Enter. After a while, the result. And in my log, hopefully. In my log for the spring app here. Oh, why doesn't this run? Oh, I've put the log the log at the higher rate at uh, just a second. Uh, info. Because otherwise it impacts my load tests. So logging, if you fire a lot, it's gonna impact here. So in Chrome, refresh, come back to IntelliJ, and you see here, uh, start on virtual thread. Now, what do you know? Okay, so yes, they are already doing it. The que whoa, the question may be too low level. Yeah, I love, I love it. Do you know if the virtual thread computable comp comp what CT? Can your thread internal switch overhead is lower, is much lower. I, I I didn't study that to be honest, but I bet because it's a it's a context switch done in user space. You don't need to have operating system kicking in and preempting your your thread. You're just gonna have the same carrier thread as far as the operating system is concerned to which java decides to park that and puts another one much faster i'm sure actually i think i read an article on that on, on infoq the infoq articles are good on these kind of problems of questions the concept behind it is similar but real usable thread runs code from multiple sources yeah the many things that os forcefully changes the source after some quota yes it, it feeds it it feeds the code with uh, preemptive uh, places to interrupt them. Well, in Java, you can't do that. Java does not do that yet. They could. They could. But they only changed the library code in GVM that um, through which you exit the GVM to block to do some network. I hope that answers it. If you have some, 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 if you found some resources on this, share them with me. I want to see that. I'm curious. With using virtual threads, do we lose the benefits of functional programming, like telling how to do, and not how? I mean, like what to do, not how to do. Yeah, yeah. Are these really benefits, or are they just some learning curve that the juniors need to take, and that a risk that we take for them not un not understand our code? I mean, like, I keep I keep thinking about the, the horror that I've seen in reactive uh, flows. And like, are you sure they all get it? Are you positive? Huh? I mean, like functional programming should be reserved for, for very hot flows and then do orchestration of streams and, 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 and not just any <laughs> rapid in the functional interface. Gilam is here with the Vavr. Right. If you have a problem with non-blocking callbacks in la la la, I've seen that. Only for concept. Don't use Node.js. <laughs> okay. Uh, can we in later version of Java, can we combine streams logic and virtual threads? Wow. Now you're talking. These are the good, these are the questions I don't know to answer. Let's see. Streams logic and virtual threads. Yeah, let's imagine. You have a stream doing some blocking code. Streams doing blocking calls, it's already wrong. It means you are doing some blocking call, maybe network in a loop. That's dangerous and waste and wasteful but still in you can already do that you can do a stream and then read the file send the message send the network yeah you can do that yeah, the second question the next question however beat me i don't know this is a good question for for google now i know that you can use parallel streams on a your own fork join pool i'm not i don't know if your fork join never tried I don't know if your fork join pool, your custom fork join pool, can actually be told to run on virtual threads. I'm not sure it's the point there. A fork join pool will fork and join and reuse threads, whereas a virtual... I'm, I don't know the answer to that. No. You, you don't say yes, I don't know. How you can tweak that? Can we process client request sequentially in reactive context? I mean, we are uh, raised condition in flux. Yeehaw! You did not use immutable objects, didn't you? I can't find any research about locking. Locking? Locking event? What? How can we wait such a problem? Ooh. Oh, so you are, you are tempted to use some synchronization mechanism in a reactive chain. That'll help us all. Now, reactive should be working only with immutable objects. If you are changing stuff and you have a race condition, you are changing state. So the 
correct architecture move here is to favor immutability. Only use records, for example. Only use records in your um, uh, uh, reactive pipelines. And if you want to change the record, create a new instance. Mm -mm. It's dangerous to start changing. I've seen that several times. People using synchronized keyword. Imagine that inside their reactive chains. Oh my God! You can block scheduler threads. Terrible move. Don't don't try to avoid that. Imagine deadlocking some thread that you should not even block. Imagine deadlocking a scheduler. Yeah. Mm. Which I should I mean not to use not just instead of GVM. Nah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Mm. Oh, reactive even loop works when GF. Ah, interesting. Okay. Like, mm -hmm. stream gathers are planned to offer VT support. Thank you. I did not know that, Jensen. Thank you. Right. Now, I finished the Zoom question to see the questions on YouTube if they are still here after 40 minutes of questions. This is not healthy, but let's try. Uh, so, from the beginning of uh, the line. Good, good, good. If uh, uh, how many virtual threads can run a Windows 32 or 64 bit machine? Thirty-two bits, really? What was the limit for thirty-two bits again? The the maximum uh, memory it can it can handle? Thirty-two bit can handle what? Two to the power of twenty of thirty-two. Um, the the coolest way I found to multiply I I, I learned to multiply to use a computer. I put a comment, I paste that, and I put an equal, and I wait for <laughs> compiler to tell me the result. This is 4 gigabyte of maximum RAM. With 4 gigabyte of maximum RAM, um, if I divide this by, let's say, 2 kilobytes, that means 2 to the power of 11, okay? Uh, that means 2,000 threads to fill. Probably I'm doing something wrong here. Am I? Probably doing something wrong. It's a matter of memory. That's the point. Uh, uh, how much memory can you? Because once you can accept a lot of load, the next button that you're gonna hit is your memory or the capacity of the systems that you're gonna call. You're gonna flood them. You're gonna you're gonna fire against your database until it burns with virtual chat. Because suddenly you can take ten thousand concurrent requests. Right. How many virtual threads? If I upgrade to 21 and for... I don't really get some of the questions. Right. Are virtual threads stable for production? Not yet, my friends. Wait, wait, March, April. Maybe start with some low criticality, not some critical super core project of yours. Testing on virtual threads. It's the same. What changes? Let's see. Virtual threads. Ah, I know what changes. You are going to be interested to detect blocking code, not blocking code, thread pinning. This is the next test that I've seen in Quarkus one day. Uh, let's see if I can find it rapidly. Quarkus virtual threads. Good article, I recommend it. It's in the, it is a slide. Um, pin. There. Let's see. Huh? No. Pin. Detect pin. Let's see. La, 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 and there were, they were writing a test uh, saying that should not pin. So um, this is, you are interested, hey, is any library pinning my thread? Or maybe I should pin it, I should have been pinned once, not more. This is what you may be concerned if you, if you want to go super scalable. On this. Right. Yeah. What happens when you open regular threads in virtual threads? You die and go to hell. No, uh, you you are back in, in with wasting resources. One megabyte, boof. Right. Will virtual threads affect how we trace application? No, you asked that also here. Petro, what are the risks of migrating to virtual threads? Exactly, good one. Um, deadlocks, not deadlocks, but thread pinning is the correct term. You don't get the same benefit. And there is one more more, Something else can happen. Um, if the number of carrier threads running your virtual thread is low, you might have a worse performance. Perf per worse performance for CPU bound tasks. Right? Depends, but it, you could. 
Will thread dump help me in case of virtual thread? Yes, thread dump help you. I've showed you guys a, a thread dump done with Java 31, which actually links virtual threads to one another with structured concurrency, but they work just the same as before. Nothing changes in terms of, of, of thread dump in that case from our experience. Typical crude Spring application with database and stuff should become more resource efficient and performant. If you have enough load, 30, 40% increase in performance. Because you are, you, are, you are wasting less memory and you are shifting from task to task faster because the context which is, is faster. So yes, you could see improvement, right? Is volatile keyword. What, where did that came from? Yes, it forces a read through the cache in processor, but what does that have to do with anything? No. What does non-blocking mean? Look, man, if you want some example about volat volatility thingy, let me give you an example. The only example I found useful, let's see, volatile. It's a puzzle. I'm going to create a gist for you and commit git, git right? create gist, gist. I share the link with you in the YouTube chat where you ask the question. If you are interested to see the uh, break your brain, do that, read the article, be happy. Uh, if your bottleneck is the database, is are gonna are virtual threads gonna do any difference? Brilliant question. It's gonna make things worse. Gonna make things worse. Because if your if your database is burning, um, virtual threads are just gonna allow your system to scale higher. And you're gonna put more pressure on your database. It's gonna make things worse. <laughs> so no. Basically, that's what virtual threads are actually gonna gonna highlight. They are gonna push the bottleneck deeper. Someone somewhere things are gonna blow. Probably the database. Maybe the queue. Maybe. The API you're calling from the other system, right? Somewhere things are going to blow up because you are suddenly much more efficient, much more powerful. You can take much more load. The reactive API supports back pressure. Virtual threads don't. Back pressure is a way to push back against a stream of events. When you are using stream of events, go reactive period. Virtual threads are for fire by fire. The closest match to a back pressure for virtual threads would be a 503 service unavailable. Hey, I'm full. Right? So no, there is no back pressure in um, in virtual threads. No. Only communication over protocols toward from to your to your, to your, to your clients. Any tool which can help an identification of pin virtual threads exists. Ah, good question. Read into the article I've just shared with you guys uh, from uh, Quarkus. They've done it. Copy paste. Uh, uh, see what they did. Excellent. Good. Let's see questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, more que this is by far the biggest question, the largest set of questions I've ever had. I don't see, it's basically one more hour of debate. I don't see what's so revolutionary about virtual just compared to reactive programming in Java. The only difference is that is in the load that needs to be processed. Okay. I know personally some, some companies, some teams that have chosen reactive programming just in order to save threads and take more load for the same costs, for the same operational costs. They've taken more, more design pressure and pain just to save costs. Those guys are going to be delighted by virtual threads. They can give up on reactive and so it's not wasting threads. Java had that for 28 years. It's really the biggest change in concurrency since Java 8. Is virtual threads taking the same one megabyte of resources creation? No, because the carrier threads are fixed. Let's say eight. Creating a virtual thread allocates several hundreds of bytes. It's super fast. You should benchmark that. Virtual threads pinning. Yes. You have a slide, please. No, oh my God. You have a carrier thread that runs your virtual thread. Together, they are very happy. They execute your Java code. At one moment, those guys, right? They, they, they stick into what they call a synchronized method. Now, a synchronized method is implemented, the synchronized keyword is implemented by the GVM uh, via some native C++ code. The moment your execution moves from Java into C++, virtual threads in there are not able to be unpinned because unpinning 
is only done in GVM when you try to block the thread to wait for some I.O. If you are in C++, they did not instrument the code in C++ native code to unpin the virtual thread. So you're stuck there. So there is no way to, un to, to take the virtual thread part of the stack, put it on the heap, and re reuse this to stick it in another virtual thread. You can't do this. They are both stuck one with the other and in the synchronized or native code that is blocking your Java institution. Really nasty example. How to prevent object-oriented, uh, or no, how to prevent out-of-memory errors using completable features. What? Should we always use completable features backed by fixed thread pool? Well, yes, it's a good practice to have a fixed thread pool. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. But the fork join pool is also by default limited to n minus one CPUs. So they're limited. So yes, in most cases in a string application, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna run your completable features on a fixed thread pool. That until Java 21. After that, you would consider moving them to virtual threads. Philosophical question. I love those. Thank you, Akash. I feel after VT, functional programming and computable, computable features are getting backslash. Uh -huh. So will VT discourage people from embracing more functional programming and computable future? Probably. Is that good or bad? Good. I know most of us here at this time of the day, after hours, spending our own personal time to learn and debate stuff. I know that us here gathered are those guys who want to learn more and are willing and learn, eager to learn more. And we are thrilled to discover a new programming paradigm. Yeah. But there are innocent people in our, in our teams. There are juniors, majors. Someone will have to maintain the code. Will they get that Kung Fu that we wrote over there? Will they be able to change the unit test we wrote for that Kung Fu? Will they even understand the unit test we wrote for our reactive chain? No. So keep simple. Keep it simple. We have an API to update the user. Okay. My God. I have to leave soon. Sorry for wrong question about WebFlux. I mean, let's say we have an API to update the user balance and that API must process requests concurrently. Okay. I cannot lock user balance object. No, you can't. Go even stream here, even sourcing here. The user balance is a traditional way, traditional place to apply event sourcing. You can just insert events and then asynchronously update a running view of the current amount. It depends. In some dark cases, you could imagine keeping some data in memory, maybe make it atomic, atomic double, atomic integer, atomic long, something. Atomic, atomic reference, ah, I, I told you. Um, public, static, not public, static, but an atomic, atomic reference of an immutable user balance object, which is used inside your reactive flow. There is no synchronized thingy in the folder. That could work. We did that. At what point uh, the amount and amount of virtual threads become relevant comparing to using platform threads? Java measuring harness framework is your friend. Test. I don't have that kind of information. Benchmark. Right, folks, I believe I've, no. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, good, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we process clients request sequentially in reactive context? Ah, I mean, okay. Folks, one more line. One last question if you have one last concern. It's been too long. I'm sorry, but it's all recorded. So you could have left at any point you want. Any other points, question, idea? Thank you all. 68, 68 people still on YouTube. 46 still here in Zoom. <laughs> we had a peak of 100, what? 170 people on Zoom and 100 in YouTube. I think that, that broke the record. Thank you very much for your attention and energy. And we'll see you for the next episode, for the next idea in here, which I, I will not be the, um, the speaker for the next one. There will be a friend of mine telling us about event storming and event sourcing and how the synergy works between them. And I will be there asking questions and moderating and answering you guys and debating. Constructive feedback. Oh, 
Okay, thank you very much, Balas. So I'll go and do that. Thank you. Sorry. Have a nice day, everyone. I have to leave. <laughs> My wife is burning. Bye bye, folks, everyone, and uh, see you for the next one. Take care. Bye. Three, two, one, and three. Go, go, go. Back to your left.